Hi, everybody. I'm an unbelievably grateful recovering addict, and my name is Ron. But my family and my good friends call me Ronnie. Thanks. I must be in the right place. And I'm so happy I'm going first. Ah. Oh. I am, oh man, <laughs> I am so nervous right now. My fiance Michelle always tells me, honey, you're not nervous, you're excited. So I'm extremely excited right now. <sighs> yeah, my heart is pumping a mile a minute, my hands are sweating, my knees are knocking. Remember the money we spent to try to feel that way? <laughs> Oh, boy. You know, the last time I was this excited, it was the first time I ever had sex. The only difference was, that night, I was all alone. Hey, what do you think, a couple of hundred people here or something tonight, or what? Huh? 5,000, 10,000, 15,000, I don't know. i tell you what, though, is there anybody here tonight in their first 30 days of clean time? If you are, could you stand up and let us welcome you to Narcotics Anonymous? Welcome, welcome to the program that saves the lives of addicts around the world. And if I have any hope for you, it's that please keep coming back. Please keep coming back until the day happens in your life where you realize how desperately you need us. And then hopefully the day will come when the new person will turn to you and desperately need your help. And you'll be there for them. Please keep coming back. You know, in 1953, Jimmy Kennan made a decision to start a fellowship for addicts. To, to have a place for people like us to come, to meet regularly, to support each other to stay clean, to support each other to work 12 steps, and to support each other to find a power greater than ourselves that can help us to stay clean a day at a time. And Jimmy Kennan, we all thank you from the bottom of our heart. I 
was very fortunate to meet Jimmy when I had about six months clean. I was living in a recovery house in Pasadena, and we went to a barbecue at a recovery house in San Fernando Valley. And my sponsor at the time, who used to work in the old World Service office at Jimmy's house, said, come on, I want to introduce you to Jimmy K. And we walked up to this frail little gray-haired man with a crew cut and a hearing aid. And I never felt such warmth in all my life when he hugged me and said, welcome to Narcotics Anonymous. And I have to believe that that love is still in all of our rooms today. And look what we have here tonight. Thank you, Jimmy. I hope somehow you're looking down on all of this, because I'm sure you'll be smiling. You know, all my life I felt separated from other people. It didn't matter what I had, didn't matter where I lived, didn't matter what I looked like. I felt separated. You know, I'm the kind of guy that when I get uncomfortable, I want to put something between you and me. Might be anger, might be comedy, might be a pair of glasses. But you know what? Tonight I feel like we're all one. Thank you, Narcotics Anonymous. You know, I'm a grateful home group member of the Hoodlums Haven Friday night candlelight meeting in San Diego, California. There's a bunch of our home group members that are here tonight supporting me being up here. I've lived in San Diego since 1977, but I gotta tell you that inside here I'm a New Jersey boy. <laughs> I was born and raised, I was born in Elizabeth, New Jersey. I was raised in Roselle, New Jersey. I came from a great family. I had a lot of good friends as a kid growing up. We played baseball. We went to dances. We had fun with each other. And you know, a lot of those good kids that I grew up with, they're never going to get a chance to sit in a meeting of Narcotics Anonymous because this disease robbed them of their lives. This disease took away their freedom. This disease made them a vegetable. I saw this movie, I was just in New Jersey for six weeks visiting my family and I saw this movie called Saving Private Ryan. And I was never so moved at one part of the movie where this old man who was in World War II who was saved by a bunch of guys in the service that all gave their lives so that this man could live. He went to their graves and he started crying uncontrollably. And he turned to his wife, knowing that the men he was visiting died so that he could live. And he said to her, do you think I was a good enough man? Do you think I was a good enough father? Tell me I didn't waste my life. And when I think of my friends that aren't here, to enjoy this with me, the only thing that I can hold on to is that I hope to God I can live my life so that other addicts don't have to die of this disease. I know our literature says that it's our responsibility to carry the message of Narcotics Anonymous, but I also understand that only God can deliver that message.
I am so lucky to be clean and to be recovering in the program of Narcotics Anonymous. And I need to tell you how I got to Narcotics Anonymous. Through this program, I've, I've almost been clean 16 years now. I've had something that a lot of us never get. That's the ability to live life on life's terms without putting drugs in my body. And I am truly, truly grateful. You know, in 1977, my PO was good enough to say, Ron, I'm going to transfer you to California. You can go live with your aunt and uncle. You'll have a new PO out there. You tell me you want your life to change. I'm going to give you a shot. And I thought in my mind that if I could just get away from my friends and the bad influences and the streets of the Lower East Side in Harlem, if I could just get away from those little tray bags of heroin, from those methadone lines, if I could just get away from New Jersey, my life would change. And I was totally sincere about wanting my life to change. And I see the same sincerity in the inmates that I see every month on my hospital and institution panels that I take into our county jails. Anybody in H&I? I want to tell you how God's blessed me. Five of the guys that I sponsor, I met locked up behind the walls. This program works. This program works. When I moved out to California, I thought my life would change. I had the same sincerity I see in the inmates that tell me, Ron, when we get out of here, brother, we're going to hook up. We're going to get together. I'm going to see you at a meeting. I'm tired of my life. I'm tired of jails. I want something different. And then I don't see them. And I know why. Because the disease takes over. The disease says things like, Hey, you can have just one beer. You never had a problem with reefer. You just got to stay away from that crack pipe. Hey, as long as you're not shooting heroin, you're okay. Maybe we'll just get on methadone for six months and find a job. You know, and get that right girlfriend. You know, the one that's going to change us. Or maybe if we can just get that good job. You know, that good paying job. Or live in that nice house. I want to tell you that I moved 3,000 miles from New Jersey to a, a mansion in the hills of La Mesa with my wealthy aunt and uncle. I didn't know a soul in California. And in three months' time, I was shooting dope with a guy named Bosco in Logan Heights. Something happened. I had sincere desires. My plans were different. But the disease of addiction doesn't really care about this addict's plans. It talks to me. And it doesn't yell. It whispers. It says things like, Ron, you can steal that. Nobody's going to know it's even gone. Your boss won't find out. Ron, don't tell the truth. No, 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 no. No, Ron, don't tell the truth. Manipulate your way through this. You will experience a little bit of guilt and remorse, but so what? Look what you're going to gain. Ron. So I came to California, and I thought everything was going to be different. 
and everything was different except my disease of addiction and I started using and I started using and in 1981 a man who worked for my company took me to my first meeting and when I came there you guys told me Ron look for the similarities not the differences and I found all the differences you see you didn't come from where I came from you didn't live where I lived and do what I've done and you don't really feel like I feel and you don't understand I'm different I've been using since I was 13 I've been on heroin since I was 18 you don't understand and so I looked for the differences and I didn't stay clean I was this perpetual newcomer in NA for like two years in and out of recovery houses in and out of detoxes I'd be in the meetings in San Diego and you know how we say in the beginning of our meetings is there anyone in their first 30 days of clean time we will start with Ron and we'll work our way around the room tonight they knew me for what I was an addict in the grip of addiction an addict in the grip of denial and I struggled desperately to stay clean and I couldn't I bounced in and I bounced out and then finally the miracle happened the miracle that had to happen in this addict's life and I believe the miracle that has to happen in all of our lives I was given the gift of desperation I had relapsed in the summer of 1982 I was running with two guys that are both in prison one will never get out under the three strike law of California one night I woke up and I had this massive pain in my chest and I couldn't breathe and I said what and the pain started going down my arm and down my left side and I thought I had some liquor in the kitchen if I just had a couple of drinks I would relax and be able to sleep so I went into the kitchen and I hit down a, a couple and got a little buzz and went back to sleep and about two hours later I was on fire and every time I breathed I had this pain going down my arm and down my chest and I just knew I was dying I didn't know what was wrong but I knew I was dying and I called the paramedics and they came to my house and they put me in the ambulance and they took me to this hospital and all the way there it was a struggle it was a fight because they kept trying to put oxygen on my face and every time they would put oxygen on my face in the ambulance it was like throwing gasoline on a fire and the pain would intensify ten times and I'd rip off the mask and they no, no no Mr. Gonzalez you gotta put this on your and we're fighting in the ambulance right they finally get me to this hospital and I'm admitted to this hospital and I've got bacterial endocarditis of the heart valves I've got a staph infection that I inje injected into my body and it's a fast-moving infection I've got embolized in my right lung I've got pneumonia I've got hepatitis my kidneys are failing I've got 105 fever I've got septicemia of the blood system and I've got osteomyelitis of the two top ribs my bone marrow was being eaten away and they put me on all these machines and they took me to the eighth floor of this hospital and every time I would come out of unconsciousness the pain was so excruciating that they would hit me with Demerol mix in Vistarol let me go back to sleep so that I wouldn't feel the pain and after about two and a half weeks in this hospital I started to come around and I was on all these machines breathing apparatus intravenous heart monitors and the doctor came in and said Ron you're a very sick man I see you have a long history of heroin addiction you're gonna be on machines here for eight weeks we think you're gonna make it but I think you should think about what you're gonna do with the rest of your life because if you ever stick a needle in your arm again Ron you're gonna blow up your heart you understand that and I go yeah I understand <laughs> oh don't we understand 
And when that doctor walked out of the room, and I was awake, and I looked around, and I saw these machines, I started feeling really uncomfortable. And I don't know about you, but what I do when I'm really uncomfortable is I want to change the way I feel. And I thought, you know, I've got all this money here. I bet you if I call Bobby, he'll bring me a couple of balloons of stuff to the hospital. And yeah, I know what the doctor said. If you ever stick a needle in your arm, you're going to blow out your heart, right? You know, but I've got this little button, and I can hit the nurse's button if something happens. I need some relief. I need some relief, and I need it now. And so I called Bobby up on the phone, and I said, Hey, Holmes, I'll kick you down if you bring me a couple of balloons. Where are you at? I'm on the eighth floor. You're where? I'm on the eighth floor of this hospital. And Bobby wanted to get well. Bobby started bringing me heroin to the hospital. Now I've got a big dilemma. Everybody in Narcotics Anonymous hears, Hey, did you hear about Ron G? He's dying. He's in the hospital. You better go see him. He doesn't have long to live. So now here I'm trying to fix every day with my connection coming to the hospital and all you bright-eyed and bushy-tailed NA members are, Hi, Ron. We miss you, Ron. You got to pray for the willingness, Ron, to do whatever it takes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, I know, I know. Could you leave now, maybe? Uh, willingness, that's, yeah, yeah, but my, okay, all right. So it was kind of weird, man. I've got all these really nice, clean-cut, bright-eyed people coming in. There's Bobby. We used to call him Mumbles. You had to kind of know what, you, well, anyhow. So Bobby would bring me heroin every day and I can remember every time fixing, thinking like, is this going to be the one that blows it up? No, 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 you'll be all right. You'll be all right. And then my mom and my sister drive 3,000 miles because they, they told them, we don't know if your son's going to make it. They drove all the way from New Jersey to California. Now I'm fixing a couple of balloons of heroin a day. They're hitting me with Demerol every three hours. You know, I've got this heavy nod going. No, I, I, big sign in my room, oxygen, no smoking. And I'm sitting here with a cool filter king, you know, uh, nodding. My sponsor comes in and goes, are you supposed to be smoking with that sign? I go, yeah, but you can't. It's only for the patients. You see, you can go out and have a cigarette. I'm stuck here for eight weeks. My mom and my sister come out. One night, mom's on this side. Diane's on the other side. The phone rings. It's Bobby. Hey, Ron. I got two blondes. Oh, you do? Well, my mother and my sister's here, and I, you can't come up. Well, you got five minutes to come down to the lobby and get your stuff or I'm gone. The mind starts working. Remember those days? What's it going to take? How am I going to do it? What do I have to do to accomplish this feat? It's like you got this cape on with a big A on your chest. Addict! Got a cup now! I see my mother, I see my sister, I see these machines, I know how to turn them off. Click, click, click. Got this gray little robe on with my ass hanging out the back, right? I can hardly walk. I'm a really sick guy, believe me. I look like Fred Sanford. Remember Fred Sanford? I gotta go, Ma. Where are you going? I got to go to the nurse's station. They forgot my meds. Well, why don't you just ring the buzzer and have them come in? You don't understand, Ma. I'll be right back. So now I'm shuffling past the nurse's station with that one thought. Remember that one thought? Remember that uncontrollable 
overwhelming desire to use and nothing could stop that look at us today we're clean we're clean what a miracle i get on the i get on the elevator i'm on the 8th floor right my ass is still hanging out the back I go all the way down to the lobby, the doors open up, here's this poor old lady with a bouquet of flowers, looks at me like, I go, hi, hi, how are you, hi, nice to see you. I go by her, Bobby gives me the outfit, gives me the two balloons, gives me the spoon, I put them under my arm, I got no pockets. Back on the elevator, up to the eighth floor, the doors open up, there's my mother, there's my sister, there's three nurses, you know. They're all talking at once, and all I can think is, get to the room, get to the room, get to the room. They're following me, they're talking, man. I go into the hospital room where I'm staying, I go into the bathroom, I lock the door, they're pounding. Open this door! Open this door! I get out the two balloons, I got the spoon, I throw them in the spoon, you know. I got the outfit, and I'm looking around for the sink. There ain't no sink. Now I've got this infection in my whole body and I look at the toilet. Ah! You know, what a freedom it is to be able to share that insanity in the light of humor when in actuality what I just painted you was the picture of a helpless hopeless human being suffering from a disease which is progressive which is incurable and which is fatal but our book tells us that once we stop using drugs once we arrest the disease of addiction, recovery is then possible. The gift of desperation finally hit me the day I woke up and I saw myself for who I really was. And I broke down and I begged my sponsor for help and I called the recovery house in Pasadena and I begged them to please take me in. And after spending eight weeks on these machines, my mother and my sister drove me to this recovery house and it was the beginning of a whole new life for me. When they dropped me off at this recovery house, I looked at them and I was in such a deep depression, I felt my life was over. You see, I had a career in New Jersey that when I was busted by the State Narcotic Strike Force in New Jersey, I was fired and I lost that career. And miraculously, three years later, I was given another chance in California to resume that career. And now, three years later, my addiction is robbing everything of my life again. And when I went to that recovery house, I knew that my career was over and that my life was over. I felt like my life was over. I didn't feel like it was just starting. So if you're new and you're new here and you feel like your life is over, hopefully it is. Now you can start a new life. A life of freedom, a life of hope, a life of recovery. I spent my first eight months at this house. I worked up to my eighth step in this house. I was surrounded by 65 other recovering addicts. We went to three NA meetings a day. We had step studies. Our NA basic text 
just came out. We finally had a book that we could cherish, that we could study, that we could find hope in. I had a sponsor. My insides were starting to change. And I want to share something. A month after I left this house, when I was about nine months clean, the obsession to use hit me. And it was only because I had been going to all those meetings and interacting with all those addicts and working those steps that I was able to muster up the courage to call another addict and say, I need help. I want to use. <clears throat> and for two days, they didn't leave me alone. And the feeling didn't pass. And it started to scare me all over again. But after two days of wanting to use, that obsession was lifted. And I have never had the obsession to use again. <laughs> Narcotics Anonymous has given me everything of value in my life today. And I think back and think that if I would have picked up at nine months clean all the wonderful experiences in life I would have missed and this is one of them here tonight so like I heard today it's gonna change this too shall pass the feelings of wanting to use are going to leave me, whether I use or not. I remember people saying, we go to meetings regularly, and we don't use no matter what. And I thought to myself, I'm screwed. I'm screwed. What do you mean you don't use no matter what? I don't know how to do that. And then slowly you told me not to use in between meetings, to get a sponsor, to become connected to Narcotics Anonymous, to start giving of myself, to take the 12 steps in the hopes that I can have a spiritual awakening as a result of them. And you know, I've had a, a spiritual awakening as a result of the steps. And what that spiritual awakening has been for this addict is the way I think about myself, the way I think about the world around me, the way I think about my higher power, and the way I think about using drugs have all changed dramatically. Dramatically. And because that has changed dramatically, I've been given the power, a day at a time, not to use, no matter what. And that's because of this program. That's only because of this program. You know, I came back to San Diego from this recovery house, and I was so terrified of the people in the fellowship because, you know, when I was using and in and out, I hurt people. And I did damage to people in the fellowship. And I didn't think I was going to be accepted back into the rooms. And I remember asking this guy at this recovery house, what do I do when I get there? He said, Ronnie, just make recovery your number one priority daily, and the rest of your life will take care of itself, whether you like it or not. <laughs> and if you don't, you will most likely suffer from the disease of addiction. And I gotta tell you, in 16 years, I've suffered at times from the disease of addiction. When I was two years clean, I got involved in a very addictive relationship with another member. And I'll tell you something, there's nothing more painful than addictive dynamics when two human beings are trying to be in love. There's nothing more painful when you try to make a relationship work with someone who's not done with their last relationship. And for a year and a half, 
We bounced back and forth, back and forth. And after a year and a half of going back and forth nine times, I weighed 156 pounds, I had rashes all over my back, I felt like I had been shooting dope for months, I was stressed out, the first thing I thought about every day when I woke up was her, the last thing I thought about every day when I went to bed was her, I was obsessed, I was in a, an addictive, dishonest, manipulative, compulsive relationship and it almost killed me. And I have to believe in my heart that because I never ever left the rooms of Narcotics Anonymous, because I never gave up on my service commitments, I never stopped talking about my pain, I never stopped interacting with my sponsor, I never stopped praying to God. I have to believe that all those things got me through because if you look around our rooms, a lot of people don't get through that clean. When I was three years clean, they pulled them all out. <laughs> when I was 26, they capped all my teeth because I hadn't gone to a dentist since I was 14. I would go to a dentist when it had to be pulled. Forget about a filling. No way. You have to knock me out. I'm a chicken. So they capped all my teeth when I was 26. So now I'm in recovery three years and the party's over. And my friend Dr. John in this fellowship says, Ronnie, I got to pull them all. I got to chisel all the caps off and then I got to pull all your teeth. I can't save them anymore. And I remember my friend Eddie dropping me off at the dentist and I remember walking into that dentist knowing, oh, I forgot to tell you, and he wasn't going to knock me out to do it. <laughs> the fun part. <laughs> he said, Ronnie, I've heard your story. And I really don't want to alter you by putting you out. But I promise you, <clears throat> I'll numb you up so much, you won't feel a thing. And he was right. But man, the sound, the k-clink, 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 and the odor, oh man, oh, the blood was everywhere. And I get home, and I've got no teeth, a mouthful of bloody gauze, and I think, this is a great time to quit smoking. <laughs> yeah. Then, <laughs> some time passed, and I said, no, maybe this is not such a great time to quit smoking. Honey, her, could you get me a cigarette? Oh no, you said you were going to quit smoking. Now honey, you understand, I'm a little stressed out right now. I just had all my teeth pulled. I got a mouthful of bloody gauze. And I really could use a cigarette. Now come on, you said you were going to quit. Give me a fucking cigarette and give it to me now! And here I am, right? sucking on one of these cool filter kings with a mouthful of bloody gauze and I'm thinking hey this is like a, an extra filter or something you know you know and then the gauze is brown so I gotta take it out put a new one in but you know what when I was five years clean thanks to you people I was able to surrender the longest addiction in my life, and that was to cigarettes. <sighs> I used to wheeze, <laughs> and I used to cough up all these little brown things. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <clears throat> And the doctor said things like, you know, you've almost got emphysema. I go, I know, I gotta quit, I know, I gotta quit, gotta quit. And I prayed about this every day on the toilet in the morning, reading my Just for Today, with my cup of coffee, and my more menthol. <coughs> God, please take away this obsession to smoke. 
And one day I called my dad up. And my father, he had smoked for almost 40 years. And he quit. And I said, Daddy, I'm having a hard time, man. I can't give up these cigarettes. I says, here I dodged the biggest bullet of my life, drug addiction, and I'm killing myself a drag at a time and I can't stop. And my father said, Ronnie, you're going to be amazed how easy it is to stop smoking cigarettes. He says, once you make up your mind that you don't want to smoke cigarettes anymore, you're going to be amazed how easy it is. The hard part is making up your mind. And that's the way it is for everything in this addict's life. Whether it be letting go of something that's not good for me. Once I make up my mind, it's easy. You know, because of you guys, I was able to be there when my father died of stomach cancer in New Jersey. And I want to thank the Fellowship of New Jersey in 1989 for loving me and for helping me get through one of the hardest times in my life. To watch the man that I love dwindle away to nothing <clears throat> because of stomach cancer and to be able to be there for my family and to be a ray of hope for them, to be a light for them and not to be that nuisance, that coward, that runaway that I always have been. I thank you, Narcotics Anonymous. <clears throat> I had to leave New Jersey two weeks before my father died. And I knew when I went out there that it was going to be the last time I ever saw him alive. And I talked to my sponsor and I said, Phil, what am I going to do? I said, I'm going to New Jersey and I'm losing my dad. And I don't know how to say goodbye. How do I say goodbye to my father? The man that took me to Little League and the high school dances. The guy that bailed me out of jail. The guy that was always there for me. How do I say goodbye? And Phil said, Ronnie, you're going to do what you've always done you're going to go to meetings. You're going to talk about your pain. You're going to trust God. And you're going to get through this clean. And you know, I laid on my father's bed and I held him in my arms, a hundred pounds. And I felt I had been clean for like eight years with my dad. And we had experienced so many good things, but all the guilt and remorse from the past and from what I had did to my family just wallowed up inside of me and I laid there and I knew I'd never see him again I said daddy I'm so sorry for the way I've treated you all over these years I really didn't want to do this I couldn't help myself and he said Ronnie you've got nothing to be sorry about I've got my son back and I love you I watched my sponsor relapse at 14 years clean behind pain medication. It was devastating to me. I watched my hero in recovery go through his entire bank account, a home, a motor home, a wife, and pick up four felonies after being clean 14 years. And I had to watch my, my sponsor almost do the rest of his life in prison behind a three-strike law of California. And I had to write my old sponsor in Folsom. And I had to try to love him through the whole thing. And Phil is a year clean on the streets of San Diego today because of a willingness to recover in Narcotics Anonymous. You know, Pepe Acuna, who's no longer with us, who was a long-term member of Narcotics Anonymous before he died, told me a story. He said, in 1959, the handful of addicts that were meeting regularly were having a lot of problems with each other. A lot of ego, a lot of personality problems. 
and there was a lot of dissension in the small group of addicts here in California. And after a meeting one night, there was a lot of hot-headedness going on and the thing broke up and people said, we're not coming back. And Sylvia Webster turned to Jimmy Kennan and said, Jimmy, what do we do? Do we disband this program now? Do we wait? Do we wait till another time when it's more convenient? And Jimmy said, no. He said, Sylvia, we keep these doors open, even if it's just me and you. And look what we have today. Narcotics Anonymous and the 12 Steps of Narcotics Anonymous, a loving sponsor, service work, sponsees, you know, I'm going to say this for my sponsees. God has put you all in my life. You think for me to help you, but you're saving my ass. And I love you all. I love you all. My thinking has changed in almost 16 years. The program has changed the way I think so that I have the power to act differently. There's a little saying that I want to leave you with. The power and what takes place in the program of Narcotics Anonymous. If you always think the way you've always thought, then you're always going to feel the way you've always felt. And if you always feel the way you've always felt, then you're probably going to always do the things you've always done. And if you always do the things you've always done, then you're always going to get the things you've always gotten. And if you always get the things you've always gotten, then you're always going to think the way you've always thought. We don't have to think the way we've always thought anymore. Thank God for Narcotics Anonymous. Have a great convention.